So for my presentation today on researching an oppressed group in the United States, I decided to research the Ute Indian tribe. <clears throat> so to understand the oppression that the Utes have faced and um, discrimination that they continue to face today, it's important that we first uh, take a look at the history of the Ute tribe, particularly within the past couple hundred years. So the first invasions of Ute territory began in the 18th century, or rather in the late 1700s with Spain. Spain owned a lot of territory in the Western United States. And so in the late 1700s and the 1760s, they began sending their explorers and their traders into Ute territory. And um, there were so a lot of trading happening between the two groups, some good, some bad. Um, we do know that some Spanish colonists would kidnap Utes and sell them into the Spanish slave trade, unfortunately. Um, and then less than 100 years later in the mid 1800s, many settlers from the Eastern United States began migrating into Ute territory. And most of these settlers were Latter-day Saints or members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they were fleeing from oppression themselves from the federal government actually, um, and migrating into Ute land. And uh, their arrival caused a great competition between the two groups for access to land and natural resources. And there are many accounts of skirmishes between the two groups and um, cases of theft and murder on both sides. So um, this is a brief timeline of uh, what's transpired after the Latter-day Settlers came into Ute territory. I don't have time to go into every event, but um, if you want to pause it and look at it more in depth, please do. But um, as we can see here, the federal government uh, increasingly began encroaching on the rights of Utes, um, eventually forcing them onto reservations and then shipping the land away that was part of the original reservations until in 1933, around 90% of northern Ute reservation land had actually been reclaimed by the federal government. So millions of acres of land had been taken back. So the implications of invasion um, were tremendous and are tremendous for the Utes today. Um, and we could talk a lot about Spain and how Spain set the tone for Ute foreign relations, but really it was the arrival of a lot of the Saint settlers <clears throat> that brought the, uh, the federal government to the doorstep of the Utes, so to speak, through, as I mentioned, um, forced treaties, relocating them to reservations, restricting their natural resources. And it's also important to note that the Utes, by nature, for centuries lived as nomads, um, as hunters and gatherers that were taking care of the land and had the whole lay of the land. Um, but after being forced onto reservations, the Utes were forced to change their lifestyle to raising cattle, horses, and sheep because they, they couldn't continue their hunting and gathering lifestyles, and they couldn't compete with Latter-day Saint settlers as farmers. So here I have a bunch of uh, newspaper headings and clippings um, outlining some of the issues that the Utes face today as a result of, um, of the invasions that happened a couple hundred years ago. Um, some of these are um, lawsuits happening today with the Ute tribe trying to reclaim some of that land that, as I mentioned, was taken away from them. Um, Sexual assault issues on reservations. Uh, many of these refer to uh, issues on reservations, uh, crime rates, public safety, public health issues, um, things like that that have mostly come to pass because they were forced onto reservations back in the 1800s. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the current socio-demographics of the Ute tribe. So the Ute nation, as we know them today, is split into three smaller tribal bands. The Northern Utes, which you can see on this map to the left, is in the northeastern United, or Utah, excuse me, the Ute Mountain Utes, and they reside in southeastern Utah in a much smaller area. And the Southern Utes, who are not on this map because they reside mostly in western Colorado. And we know that there are about 5,000 give or take tribal members between these three groups. And there is an issue that I'm going to delve into a little bit on a little bit later, but um, one of the uh, parts of discrimination that the Utes face today is uh, the lack of research and reports and statistics on Ute living in the United States. And so uh, because of this, it was very difficult to find uh, current social demographic information. But what I did find was for the Northern Utes, and they are the largest band of the Ute nation today, 
as you can see highlighted, they have a very high unemployment rate, about 17%, which if you compare it to the 4% unemployment rate for the rest of the US, that is a very large gap. And we also know that as of 2013, there are 65, about 65% 65 of the high schoolers of the youths graduate, which means that about a third of their high schoolers drop out before receiving their diploma. And we also know that the median household income for the northern youths is about $35,000, $36,000, which does put them in the low income bracket uh, in, the, in the United States. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the educational responses of past and present to youth oppression, particularly in the Utah public schools. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, there are youths that live in other places in the United States, but the majority of them live in Utah, so that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. So there have been efforts to promote equal education for youths, and obviously this these are not all of them, but these are the ones I wanted to highlight today. Um, we know the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which protects youths and all Native American students and actually all non-white students from discrimination in school programs and activities. So that means that, um, that all youth students have a right to free and appropriate public education. They can't be discriminated from that. And there's also the Ute language policy that was authored in the 1980s by the Ute government. And this was an effort to preserve the Ute language being taught in schools and bilingual programs. There's also the Native Culture, Language and Access for Success, or the CLASS Act of 2011. And this was an effort to protect mm -hmm. the um, Ute's tribal government's control over education of registered Utes. So their right to teach their their children about their culture and their language and their history, and essentially. But just as there have been efforts to promote equality for youths in school, there have also been a um, lack of effort, I guess you could say, equally. Um, and as I mentioned previously, because there is such a huge um, deficiency in statistics and reports on youth progress in general, but particularly in education settings, it's challenging to pinpoint local harmful policies, or rather lack of helpful ones. However, we do know that Utah does not have an Indian Education Council. They also do not regularly investigate Indian education issues across the state. So that influences our lack of information on youth students today. And additionally, uh, the Utah state government does not require the implementation of a curriculum that recognizes youth contributions to the state or the nation which can affect our youth students' sense of um, self, their self-esteem, as well as their cultural identity. In my multicultural education class, we've been talking a lot about uh, Native American students and, um, and how they're treated in schools today. And as I mentioned, because we don't have a ton of information on uh, youth students in schools, all of these uh, facts on the page refer more to Native American students as a whole. So I'm applying them to youth students specifically. But um, we've talked a lot about how there's an issue with placing youth or Native American students in public schools where the culture is different, um, mainly because public schools in the US are catered more for middle class white students and Native American students are often in the low lower income range and obviously are not white. So um, some of the school structures are are unfamiliar to them or am not catered to to their needs. Uh, we also know that the youth culture is not taught or really acknowledged in public schools very much. And um, when it is mentioned, it's combined more into a kind of blanket term for Native American culture, uh, which a lot of teachers combine all the tribes, all the Native American tribes into one idea, which does harm our youth students' sense of cultural identity, as I mentioned before. And we've also talked about in my class how these students are more likely to receive incorrect disability diagnosis and be placed in special education, where really the issues lie more with um, with a lack of compatibility between the youth culture and um, the culture of public schools. So I wanted to wrap up by briefly talking about some ways that schools uh, can help youth students I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go really fast. But the first idea is to advocate for an Indian Education Council. A lot of states in the U.S. have one. Utah does not. 
This would help us have more opportunities to conduct academic research regarding our students, and provide a deeper understanding of their issues, and promote positive policies for correcting some of these issues in public schools for youths. We should also always be striving to use inclusive literature and language while referring to the youth tribe. And just in closing, I believe that we should always strive to have high, high expectations for our youth students. They are every bit as smart and capable as any other student, and they also come from a legacy of strength and endurance from their ancestors. And I believe that we should respect and remember that and that we should, that we should do our best to help them and, and meet their true potentials in public schools. So thank you very much for listening.